Ministers are hard at work tackling all of those potholes created by Mother Nature. Coming up, an update from the DPW on the road conditions and the condition of the town budget following this harsh winter. The East Long Meadow Fire Chief is looking to expand the department to fit all growing needs in the community. Just ahead, we'll look at the proposal and why the Chief is asking for residents' help. The Old Brown Farm property may soon see new life as a forage facility, at least for this summer. We take you to the latest meeting of the Board of Selectmen. Those stories and much more coming up on LCAT News Update. Good evening, I'm Rebecca Green. And I'm Ellie Carrington. We begin tonight with potentially big changes in store for the East Longmeadow Fire Department. The Fire Department has taken the first steps in achieving its goal of expanding the force. Chief Paul Morissette says expansion is critical in order to fit the needs of our growing community. The Chief has submitted a supplemental budget request to add additional coverage. That would include a career firefighter department seven days a week for 12 hours a day with a four-person shift. Coverage would be Sunday through Saturday from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. As it stands, there are seven full-time firefighters covering an 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. shift Monday through Friday. We have periods of time when our response time seems to be elevated and after we ran the data it does prove to be elevated uh, six o'clock in the morning till eight before the full-time guys get on duty and four o'clock in the afternoon to uh, six and holidays and weekends in that six to six window uh, it, it's, it, it's a very tough time um, to get guys to the fire station you know, the career guys you know they're, they're just getting ready for work they, you know they got their kids they got their families they're worrying about and the same thing after work um, a lot of call firefighters are commuting during those times, going to and from their jobs. So th those windows are very tough. And when you ran the numbers, 75% of our calls falls in that six to six window, seven days a week. So as the next progression to move forward from where the department's been since 1974, this just seems to make sense for public safety. The fire department has been fighting for an expansion for quite some time. The staff hasn't changed since 1974. Uh, Chief Wallace tried a few times uh, to change it. Uh, he said his first attempt was in 1999, and then he tried every year, um, basically until he retired. And the, the town at that point just never really would prioritize it uh, to, to move it forward. So I think the town has seen the value, seen the growth that the town has had. We're, we're almost doubled in, in commercial, I mean, commercial and industrial properties. Our residential properties have increased. Uh, the population's gone up about 21%. Our, our elderly housing is, is, you know, grown leaps and bounds. So it's quite a bit for the fire department to protect without changing anything they've done since then. The process is currently underway. Morissette brings us up to speed on the latest and what will happen next. Currently, the Board of Selectmen has approved the budget item, uh, the supplemental budget, to move it to the Appropriations Committee. The Appropriations Committee has recommended it to go to town meeting, and at town meeting, the town residents will have a chance to approve the next step, and from there, it'll be about a six-month process before it actually takes effect, and we go into a seven to seven, um, 12 hours a day shift. The community has a chance to chime in on the expansion issue. A response time survey is an online survey open to the EL community. Each member of the household, 18 years or older, can vote on whether they're in favor of the expansion. The survey can be found on the East Long Meadow Town website under Newsflash. So far, Morissette is happy with the outcome. We have about 200 respondents to the survey. I'd like to get a few more. Uh, we're actually doing a, uh, a fire ed presentation at the senior center and we're gonna be assisting the residents with hand filled out survey forms or with their software and their activities uh, people. We're gonna you know, help assist them you know, filling out the surveys online. So it's doing well uh, and we're getting a majority of the people are seeing that there is a concern um, with them as far as response time. There is some um, questions. And they are, they would like to see the department expand to provide more um, coverage. The chief says the bottom line is the expansion will bring faster response times. A faster response it just gets us there quicker. Uh, the, um, fire doubles in intensity every 30 seconds. Uh, so the faster we can get there and keep a kitchen fire, a kitchen fire, or a bedroom fire, a bedroom fire, so it doesn't expand to the rest of the house and move forward from there is, is our goal. Our goal is to save property, to save lives. And, and the same thing in a car accident. If somebody's in a car accident, they need to be extricated from the car. The, 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 the quicker we can get there, the, you know, it, it's, it's safer for everybody involved. 
Finally, Morissette talks budget, value, and breaks down the numbers. For next year, the, the budget increase is about $65,000 on top of the, the entire fire department budget. It's about a 12% increase over our entire budget, which, uh, like I say, has been approved by the Board of Selectmen for, for the amount of hours that we're going to be getting out of it. And the Appropriations Committee is recommending it. They do see there's a value to it. I was extremely uh, happy that they saw the, the value and, and are willing to you know, let the townspeople vote on it. Residents will be able to vote on the proposed fire department expansion at the town meeting on May 18th. In other news tonight, any driver in town can tell you that it's a bumpy ride out there. After a severe winter, the DPW sure has its work cut out for them. Now that it's getting warmer, road crews are out in full force this week trying to take care of the damage from Mother Nature. DPW Director of Operations, John Collins, says it's one of the worst winters he's seen in a long time. He brings us up to speed on what issues they're dealing with in the process of repairing the roads. We've had frost heaves everywhere. The, I know the high school parking lot, some of the parking lots where the blacktop's a little bit thinner, it, it, it has a lot to do with the, uh, the gravel or lack of, in some cases. Uh, but the frost heaves were just so severe at East Long Meadow, in, in most communities. And uh, so, yeah, this is as bad a winter as I've seen in a long time, for sure. So the question is, now that the weather's warming up, what is being done about the road damage? We're, we're very, very busy. We're out now uh, milling areas, the worst areas, so that we can start paving. The blacktop plants are just starting to open. The plant in Chicken Beyondrix opened about two weeks ago, so they opened early, so we've been able to get hot mix for more permanent repairs. Palmer um, and Gleason's are supposed to open this week, which is a little more convenient for us, but we are working on the roads with, with most of our highway crews, um, preparing them for blacktop, and uh, it's going well. The state says most cities and towns have gone over their snow removal and repair budgets. East Long Meadow is no exception. In terms of exact numbers, the amount will be determined soon with some help from the state. The state has um, granted some monies for pothole damage. I know that the superintendent of public works, uh, Bob Parent, has um, met with them. I, I'm not absolutely certain of the, the final amount. It's somewhere in the $80,000 range, maybe a little bit more, uh, so that we're compensated for some of the work we're doing, some of the blacktop that we're putting down and repairing the, the the, the damage done by the winter itself. Um, so it will take some of the crunch out of our budget. But at this end, it's very difficult to say what it's going to cost. In the meantime, Colin asked drivers to be patient. He says they're prioritizing the worst roads and getting to them as soon as possible. The old brown farm property off of Hamden Road may see some new life this summer. The town-owned land has sat largely vacant, with the exception of a community garden. But a new plan involves a 4-H, a new outdoor arena, and educational clinics for all kids of all ages. Recently, part of the Brown Farm property became home to a popular community garden. But the land also includes an old barn and an indoor horseback riding arena. Outside sits the remnants of an old outdoor arena. During Tuesday's Board of Selectmen meeting, representatives from the Friends of the Brown Farm and the 4-H submitted plans to spruce up the old property and put it to use for this summer. We would like to use the, the Brown Farm property. The building, one and if the, the structural comes through and it's safe to be used, and we'll review whatever issues. But in the meantime, what we'd like to do is we'd like to put back in place the outside riding arena. The fence posts are there, they exist. Um, and we'd like to be able to complete that. We have posts lined up that I can pay for out of the Brown Farm Fund. And I've spoken to the DPW and they said they would assist me in, in digging the post holes and putting it back in place. Um, if we can do that right there alone, we can get up there this summer and we can start running some clinics outside, use the property, get kids up there, start utilizing the property. Um, so I'm hoping that we have permission to be able to do that because I mean, I can put a post, you know, I can put the fencing back up. We have an outdoor arena. If the town decides down the road that you don't want it, we can take the post out. We can, but it would be nice to be able to get up there, have an enclosure where you can keep your animals safe and sound and the kids are safe and sound mm -hmm. and, and start doing some clinics up there, so. The plan is to provide area residents, especially children with clinics and other educational outreach programs run by 4-H. 
in terms of clinics and workshops and trainings, uh, 4-H offers a lot. And uh, right now we're seeing exponential growth in programming that we haven't seen in about 20 years. There seems to be a back-to-the-land movement. Uh, it's grabbed everywhere, all the way from uh, every county we've got, from Essex County all the way to Berkshire County. And what that booklet that you have in front of you shows is that we've got programs in sheep, goats, dog, horse, dairy, rabbits, and we're oftentimes uh, looking to hold clinics, educational clinics, trainings, workshops for youth in the area. So this would be, it has unforeseen potential. It, would, it could be one of the greatest gems that you've got mm -hmm. here. Cunningham says the Friends of the Brown Farm have worked out a plan that they think will be a win-win for the town. The gardens are here, yeah. our roadways here, mm -hmm. and our existing fence line goes right across. Oh, okay. Okay, and that's already there, and it's on both sides of the road. We're only going to use, obviously, this side in front of the buildings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's, there's plenty of room, plenty. When the road was put in and the parking was put in, they didn't even, you know, they didn't infringe on this at all. Mm -hmm. okay. Infringe. They didn't infringe on that area at all. So the people who actually leased the barn before the town purchased the property, they had already put in, they put $10,000 worth of sand in that area. I'm sure it's blown away because it's been sitting for 10 years and maybe sand's going to blow away. But if we can, you know, turn it over a little bit, get some of the weeds out, we're mm -hmm. looking at a really nice area to ride. Mm -hmm. We do okay. clinics with dogs, rabbits, goats, sheep, you know, whenever <laughs> we can get up there. Okay. That's, you know, something that can be done very, very quickly. We can be doing things up there by the summertime. Exactly. We have the trailer, we have the horses, we have sure. the people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The plan met with support from the board. Member Angela Thorpe supports the idea, saying it's time for something to be done with the land. And I know that the land has been sitting there waiting and waiting. And so here before us we have a proposal that's not only going to just benefit the gardeners, the, the gardeners of East Long Meadow, but it also help our children and hopefully get some more volunteers in. So I think it's time to move. The board voted in favor of plans for the outdoor arena. I'd like to make a motion to approve the 4-H, what do we call it, the 4-H Youth Development Program and the, um, and the placing of posts up at in, on the exterior area of the Brown Farm for, for use by the Friends of Brown Farm. An outdoor arena. Yes, for an outdoor arena. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Please invite us up. <laughs> Thank you so much. As for any improvements to and programs with the indoor arena, that will have to wait for further inspection and input from the board and other town officials. A warning tonight for all pet owners. If your dog or cat does not have a current rabies vaccination, now is the time to get it done. State law mandates that all pets must have the vaccination. A.W. Brown on Shaker Road in East Long Meadow is doing its part by offering the vaccination clinic. The day-long event took place on Saturday. Animal Control Officer Tom O'Connor. Every animal, uh, cat, dog, and ferrets in the state of Massachusetts need to be vaccinated against rabies. Uh, the vaccinations are one and three year vaccinations that can occur depending on the status, uh, current status of the animal's vaccination. O'Connor says getting your pet vaccinated is one step toward receiving a license for your pet, which is also a state and town requirement. Licensing is an important part of the vaccination process. Uh, when a dog is licensed, we know that it's been vaccinated. And vaccinations are uh, very important. They're not only important for the safety of the humans, the owners of the animals, and any uh, people they come in contact with, but also other animals that your animal may interact with, including wildlife. Veterinary technicians on hand say vaccinations protect your pet and others. If your dog is the biting dog and hasn't been vaccinated against rabies um, and it's reported to the town, it can actually be, it will be quarantined, um, generally seven to ten days to ensure that it, 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 and it will be in quarantined at the owner's expense to watch for um, the development of the disease. Not getting your pet the rabies vaccination, she says, can be a life or death decision. Ramifications is if the secondary dog that has been bitten comes down with it, the it's fatal. There's not really a treatment for it that has been shown to be effective. As for concerns of local wildlife spreading rabies, O'Connor advises residents to call his office if they spot any animal acting out of the ordinary. 
So do you suspect, uh, whether it be a domestic animal or a wildlife, uh, that's acting irregularly, uh, uh, and the animal is appears injured or sick, please call the police department and they will make the appropriate calls and, and response. Back at A.W. Brown, the vaccination clinic was a big success. We actually had an amazing turnout today. We did, I believe, 79 vaccines for cats and dogs. Um, not only did the community get a wonderful service that we love to do, um, because the HCC Vet Tech Club, um, we love to be able to do in, in things like this. And AC, A.W. Brown is amazing at letting us do things like this. A.W. Brown says another clinic may be in the works. We'll keep you posted. In the meantime, vaccinations are also offered at most local veterinarians' offices. Now on to sports. With the spring season delayed thanks to all that snow, we focus on the postseason awards. Here's Alcat sports anchor Colin Casey. Thanks, Rebecca and Allie. It was a monumental weekend for Esau Meadows' Connor Humphreys. Humphreys, along with 16 other athletes, were honored for their achievement for Mass Live's Athlete of the Week. The accomplishments of the athletes were celebrated with a party at Mass Live, where each athlete received their own plaque and signed the Mass Live Athlete of the Week 2014 to 2015 Winter Sports Official Poster. Humphreys does not stop there as he also competed in Nationals last weekend. Although he went 0-2 at Nationals, Humphreys' wrestling career is one for the books at 156 wins and 31 losses. Another Spartan receiving awards for athletics is senior Brett Smith. Smith, an offensive lineman for the Spartans football team in the fall, will be honored as a scholar athlete at the Western Massachusetts Football Banquet on April 12th. Smith spoke with us about the accomplishment and was grateful for the opportunity to represent Esau Meadow High on the football field. Uh, it was really a, it was a huge honor to be honest. Uh, I know like a lot of the people that I've looked up to in the past, like the uh, Blake brothers in the past years, how they've won it and I always aspired to kind of make it to that team uh, my senior year and it's just cool to be able to see like all the hard work throughout the years pay off and be able to make the team. After he graduates this spring, Brett will head to Bentley University where he will study finance and economics as well as play football for the Falcons. Although the season does not start for another four to five months, Smith has already begun preparing for his freshman year. I've been uh, in the gym a lot so I'm just trying to get myself as prepared as I can and I know the coaches will do whatever they think they can with me, and I'm excited for it. It's going to be a great, great few years there. It's never easy, but Brett has done an exceptional job balancing school with sports, earning a 4.56 grade point average while starting on the Spartans' offensive line. He credits motivation from his parents as the biggest reason for his success. Ever since I was little, I've always played sports, and my parents always stressed how important academics were, so I've kind of been forced to find a way to find like the happy medium of like succeeding and working hard for sports, but at the same time making sure I get all my schoolwork done. Brett Smith finishing off an impressive athletic and academic career at East Summit High School. Until the snow melts, that's it for sports. Back to you guys. Thanks, Colin. Well, that will do it for us tonight. Thanks for watching LCAT News Update. I'm Rebecca Green. And I'm Ellie Carrington. Until next time, good night.